right. Hey, if you have your Bible, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's the first time I've said that. We're in chapter 3 tonight. Thanks for being here. I know uh, it's cold outside, and I hear there's winter weather maybe tomorrow. And some people have COVID around that we want to keep praying for. But thanks for being here tonight to uh, worship together. So let's look at the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3. Has anyone ever heard of the three rings of marriage? Anybody ever heard of the three rings of marriage? I heard a pastor talk about this one time. He said uh, the first ring is the engagement ring, the second ring is the wedding ring, and the third ring is the suffering ring. Now, it's intended to be humorous, uh, but, you know, I think there's a little bit of truth behind that. You know how most jokes have a little bit of truth behind them? Uh, I think there's a little bit of truth there because marriage is not easy. Amen? (laughs) Marriage isn't always easy. Even if you have a wonderful, considerate, caring, and Jesus-loving spouse, like I do, you're still married to a sinner, though, right? You're still married to a sinner. And it's everybody that knows me knows this, that it's only by the grace of God that Candace puts up with me. And I know most all of you men here tonight, and so I know the same is true for you, that it's only by the grace of God Uh, that your wife puts up with you as well. Uh, But really, the the reality of it is, is that marriage takes effort. It takes work. And there's plenty of difficult times because it's two sinners uh, that are coming together as one flesh. But it's also a blessing and a joy when we follow the principles that God gives us for a biblical Marriage, And so we've come to a passage of Scripture tonight in our series in 1 Peter that gives us some important and really, I would say, some really beautiful truths about marriage. So open up your Bibles with me to 1 Peter 3, and uh, we'll jump in in verse 1. It says, In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wives by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles or wearing gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do what is good and you do not fear any intimidation. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now tonight, we're going to focus on the first six verses, and the title of the message tonight is How to Impact Your Husband for Christ. Now, you may have a question here. Why does Peter give wives instructions for the first six verses, and then the husbands, he only gives one verse? Doesn't that seem a little unfair? Any wives think that's a little unfair? Well, I can tell you it's not because Peter is biased. He's not misogynistic. It's because in this Roman culture where he is living and he is writing to, there was a vastly larger opportunities for issues to arise when a wife became a Christian and not her husband than it was for when a husband became a Christian and not the wife. That was just a reality in their culture, because men in this Roman Empire culture, men were completely in charge. Women weren't even really allowed to have an opinion. Women were basically viewed as little more than slaves, and they were viewed as completely inferior to men. Now, aren't you glad that God makes it abundantly clear in his scripture that that is not the case at all. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, There is no Jew, there is no Greek, there's not slave or free, there's not male or female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
So men are not above women in the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? Maybe from some ladies tonight? Men are not above women in the kingdom of God. Men and women are equal in value. They are equal in importance, and they are equal in worth. Now, can I tell you something that I absolutely love about the gospel accounts? I love how in the midst of a culture that viewed women as completely inferior, I love that the risen Jesus appears first to whom? To women. Women. Jesus took the entire false narrative that a testimony of a woman was of no value. That's what they believed at that time. He took that false narrative and he completely obliterates it as he appears first to Mary Magdalene and then he appears to the other Mary, Salome, and then Joanna. You know, this is also great evidence that the disciples did not make this up. A lot of people think the disciples made all this up. Now, if you were going to make up the, a false narrative about Jesus rising from the dead when he didn't, you would never, in that culture, you would never, you would never write it as women being the first to see Jesus because their culture did not value the testimony of a woman. But God values women, and they are by no means inferior to men. Now, back to 1 Peter chapter 3. For a wife to become a Christian when her husband was not, that was a major ordeal. And it could very easily bring up a whole lot of issues. And so that's why Peter gives more guidance to women in this situation. So let's jump in into how to impact your husband for Christ. Now Peter is talking directly to women that find themselves in a, let's just say, not so ideal situation of marriage. These women are married to men who the Bible says, Peter says, that they do not obey the word. Now, that might be a little bit confusing, but we know that that means that they don't know Jesus. They are not Christians. We know that from the previous chapter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, Peter uses the same phrase. And so these are Christian women who are married to unbelieving husbands. And so Peter is about to give them some encouragement. He's about to give them some strategies for impacting their husbands for Christ. So while these strategies are given for a particular situation, they can also be helpful for any woman who wants to help her husband grow in the Lord. Maybe you're here tonight as a lady, and maybe your husband is saved, but maybe he's sitting next to you, and you know he's not living for the Lord. Maybe he's at home, and you know he's not living for the Lord. Maybe it's a struggle for him to be the spiritual leader in the home. Maybe it's a struggle for him to come to church consistently. Maybe it's a struggle for him to make wise decisions for your family. These strategies can help any marriage. You see, when a husband or a wife treats their spouse with love and respect and selflessness, you can't help but have an impact on your marriage for Christ. So before we jump into these strategies, we have to set kind of a baseline. And really, this is true of every sermon you will ever hear, that you have to understand whenever we talk about doing things, it always has to be the baseline, the underlying understanding is that Jesus has already done it all. He's already paid the price. He's already lived the perfect life. You're unable to live it on your own. You are completely unable to employ these strategies that we're going to talk about tonight and next week. You're completely unable to employ these strategies effectively on your own. You cannot do it apart from the gospel. So if you want to make an impact on others for Christ, it has to be through you believing the gospel and through you walking with Jesus through prayer and through studying the Bible. That's the only way to be consistent with selflessness and to love an unbeliever, especially if it's your spouse. So strategy number one, strategy number one for wives to impact their husbands is to be submissive. Be submissive. Some of you women may wish you would have stayed home tonight. But let's read verse 1 again. He says, In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, 
so that even if some, or probably more accurately, since some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their, lo- their wives live. So Peter starts out verse 1 with the phrase that says, in the same way. So as he starts into this new section that's focused on the marriage relationship, he introduces it by connecting it to the previous passages that we've already studied about submitting to authorities placed over us. And he does that, he starts it all the way back in chapter 2, verse 12, when he says, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that... When they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. So Peter makes it clear that the purpose of our honorable conduct, the purpose of our continued submission, even when authorities fall short of what they're supposed to do, the purpose of all of this is to turn slanderers into worshipers of Jesus. It's to make an impact on others for the sake of Christ. It's about missions. It's about building the kingdom of God. It's about every Christian living on mission to impact this world for Christ. It's about God using us as a way to bring people to salvation in Jesus. And so we're commanded, all of us as Christians, to submit to civil authorities and social authorities like we've been studying All of that, not for their sake, but for the sake of Christ. And now he's telling wives to submit to their husbands in the same way. Now, notice what Peter doesn't say here. He doesn't tell these women, these wives who are married to unbelieving spouses, he doesn't tell them to leave them. He doesn't tell them to divorce them even though they have a completely different worldview, even though they have a completely different set of values. It's not what he tells them. Instead, Peter tells them, no, God is sending you back into that relationship. You're free. Your first and foremost allegiance is to God alone, but God is sending you back into this relationship to submit to even your lost husband. Now, the word submit here is the same exact word that Peter was using back in chapter 2. It means to humbly put yourself under the authority of another. It was a military term, meaning to come under the authority, to come under the leadership of the commander. And so Peter is calling wives to submit to their husbands, even if their husbands are not saved, but doing it in hopes of winning them over to the gospel. Now, you're probably well aware of this, but the idea of wives submitting to their husbands is an extremely controversial topic. People don't like to talk about this. But just like every difficult command from God, the problem is not in what God said. The problem is in our understanding of what God has said, or it's in our rebellion against what we know He has said. So let me ask you a question tonight. Which of these two statements is true? Wives should submit to their husbands, or wives are equal to their husbands. What's the answer? They're both true. They're both absolutely true. Submission doesn't make someone less valuable or less important. And this is the entire heart of the issue, is that many people have a misunderstanding that a wife submitting to her husband makes her inferior to him. But that's not what God says. You see, God has given men and women different roles within the family unit. And God has ordained that the husband be the sacrificial servant leader of the home. The head of the home, but a sacrificial servant leader. And the wife is to submit to the husband's authority. But that doesn't make her inferior to the husband any more than what we've been talking about, about Christians. It doesn't make a Christian inferior to submit to an evil world leader, right? We're not inferior. Christians are not inferior to world leaders when they submit, just like wives are not inferior to their husbands when they submit. Women are not inferior to men in any way, period. 
Women have simply been given a role that puts them in the place of submission to a husband's leadership. Now, what makes this difficult is that many husbands, even Christian husbands, are terrible leaders in their home. Many men, many that claim to be Christians, will use this text as an excuse to abuse their wife. That couldn't be any further from the truth of this passage. Absolutely absurd. That's preposterous to use it in that way. But hear me tonight. When husbands... When husbands are the sacrificial servant leader in the home, things go very much more smoothly than when they're not. The Department of Psychiatry at McGill University, it's in Canada, they gave a report several years ago about what makes marriages most successful. Now, this is a secular university. They're not associated with Christians whatsoever. Very secular place. And they gave a report years ago about what makes marriages most successful. The report says, in the most successful marriages, the husband is emotionally stronger than the wife. And there is a clear-cut division of authority and responsibility between them. And it was noted that marriages in which wives were emotionally dependent on their husbands always, almost always, produced happier, better adjusted children. Do you know why that's true? It's true because that's exactly the way that God designed it. It's exactly the way that God has designed the family. No wonder that's the happiest, most successful family, because that's God's plan. Now, let me clarify two things as we continue in our study. Women, women are not called to have the same kind of submission to every man, but rather to their own husbands. That's very important. Women are only called to have this, this type of submission to their own husbands. And then secondly, we have to state this. This is very important. Christian wives should never, never follow their husbands into sin. Wives should absolutely disobey their husband's leadership. They should not submit to their husband when their husband's leadership is contradicting what God says. So just in the same way that we've been talking about how Christians do not submit, rather we disobey any human institution that calls us to disobey God, we will disobey that human institution because our supreme allegiance is to God alone. And so the same is true for the Christian wife. So what is submission? Talk about wives submitting to their husbands a lot. Let me first tell you what submission is not. Submission is not being a pushover. Submission is not a wife being a doormat to the husband. Submission does not mean that you have to agree with your husband on everything. Submission does not mean that you're called to leave your brain at the altar. Let me tell you what submission is. Submission is the divine calling of a wife to honor her husband's leadership, and to help carry it through according to her own gifts. Now, let me repeat that one more time for you. I think it's that important. Submission, biblical submission, is the divine calling of a wife to honor her husband's leadership and to help carry it through according to her own gifts. Now, the passage says, submit so that they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live. Now, that's an interesting way to state it. But Peter is not saying here that a lost husband can be saved by merely seeing the conduct of his wife and not knowing anything about the gospel. That's nowhere in the Bible, and it's certainly not what Peter means here. The lost husband has to know what the gospel is. The lost husband has to know what it is that's changed his wife's life. And Peter's already stated back in chapter 1 that the only way to be born again is through the imperishable seed of the Word of God. So what Peter means here is that this wife is not to be pressuring or smothering her husband with evangelism. Peter doesn't tell the wife to argue theology with her husband. Or to put tracks under his pillow every night. 
or to have a pastor ambush him when she knows that he's going to be home alone. Or please don't do this, or to put Bible verses on his beer cans. Peter's point here is that when husbands know what the wife believes, when they know that, the greatest evangelistic tool at that point is the life of the wife backing up what she says she believes, a life that proves the gospel. That will have an impact. You know, that's true for every single one of us, not just wives of unbelieving husbands. The greatest tool in evangelism is conduct that proves the gospel to be true. So if you want to make maximum impact for Christ on your husband, be a submissive wife. Strategy number two for wives to impact their husbands, be faithful. Be faithful. See, now Peter begins to give us some details about what the conduct of of a wife should look like. Let's read verse 1 again, and we'll add in verse 2 this time. It says, In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Now, most translations use the word respectful here. I'm reading out of the CSB. It says reverent. How many of you have respectful in your Bible tonight? A bunch of you. Now, the Greek word literally means to live in fear, to live in fear, to be full of fear. So is Peter calling wives to live in fear of their husbands? No, of course not. If you've been with us during this study, you should recall how many times already Peter has used this exact same phrase, and every single time he uses it, it's to point out, it's to refer to our fear or reverence for only one person, and that's God himself. And so the CSB, I think, nails this translation by helping us understand what it means. It's to be a reverent person. It's to live a reverent life. Wives are to fear God And that should drive their behavior. So Christian wives should live to please God first and foremost. And all of us as Christians, we should care more about pleasing God than displeasing anyone, including our spouses. So Peter calls women, calls these wives to a reverent life. He also calls them to a pure life. That means having conduct that is above reproach. It means not being dishonest, but being faithful to God and being faithful to her husband. Being faithful to her husband means both emotionally faithful and it also means sexually faithful. See, that unbelieving husband should be able to look at his Christian wife and see a pure and trustworthy woman who respects God even more than she respects Him. He should be able to see a pure, sincere faith in her. Let me tell you a story, a true story. Years ago, <clears throat> there was a woman who was a Christian. And she was married to a man, just like we're talking about tonight, who was mar- who was, she was married to a man who was not a Christian. And that woman... She prayed and prayed and prayed for her husband to be saved. And every Sunday morning, she would get up with their son, and she would very graciously and respectfully invite her husband to come with her, to join her and their son to come to church. And every Sunday, he would decline. But that didn't stop this woman, even though he declined every single Sunday. That did not stop her from continuing to beg the Lord to save her husband. She was faithful to him. She lived out her faith in front of him. She was by no means perfect, but she lived out a pure and reverent life in front of her unbelieving husband. So many years go by of this where she's praying for her husband. Many years, and that little boy, he grew up to be a teenager. 
All the while, this woman praying for her husband, living out her faith in front of her husband. And one night, that teenage son ended up in the hospital. He had a severe asthma attack, and he was not with his parents at the time of the attack, so they had to meet him at the hospital. And when the parents finally got there to see their son, they found him there lying in a hospital bed. And that teenage boy, lying there on that hospital bed, he looked up at his dad and he said, Dad, I'm praying for you. Dad, I'm praying for you. As he's lying there on the hospital bed. Those words were seared into that father's heart. Seared into that father's heart. And that very night, that man got down on his knees and he gave his life to Christ. True story. See, God had been using that wife's testimony to impact this man. All those years, he didn't realize it, but God was using it, ultimately preparing him for that night. And He said, looking back on all those years, that his wife was never pushy. She just kept praying. She just kept being faithful. That man's name is our very own Donnie Chalk. Be submissive. Be faithful. Strategy number three for wives to impact their husband is be beautiful. Be beautiful. Let's look at verse three and four again. It says, don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles or wearing gold jewelry or fine clothes, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Now, if you're me and when I read this passage and study it, my first instinct is like, why in the world does Peter go from talking about the the way that wives should live to win over and make an impact on their husbands, why does he then go into clothing and hairstyles and jewelry? It's an interesting thought. Maybe I'm alone, but did you know that everyone, everyone is at least a little bit self-conscious about the way that they look? Everyone. Even Brother Eddie. Everyone is at least a little bit self-conscious. So the temptation is there for a Christian woman to think that maybe, just maybe, if she could be pretty enough on the outside, that maybe, just maybe, her lost husband would want to keep her around instead of getting rid of her. And maybe, just maybe, he might even be interested in her faith. Peter says, no, that is not the right strategy. Don't let your beauty consist of outward things, but rather what's in the heart. So we have to ask a question on the other side now. So does this mean, as Peter's saying, that a Christian woman should not fix her hair? That a Christian woman should not wear earrings or necklaces or bracelets? Well, obviously, that's not what Peter means. These aren't given to be absolutes. If that were so, he'd be calling women to run around without clothes on. Okay? Obviously, that's not what he means. What was it Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say? Every barn door looks better with a fresh coat of paint. He said that, not me. But Peter is saying, don't let your focus be on the external beauty. Don't let that be your strategy to win your spouse, but rather focus on what's on the inside in the heart. Focus on the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Don't focus on external beauty that the world can reproduce. Anybody can have that, and that fades away over time. But focus on the true beauty of the heart. Now listen to me. Everybody should listen to this, that true beauty inner beauty is not about what you look like. It's about what Jesus begins doing in you. It's about who you are because of Jesus. It's about God making you more like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you. 
It's about the fruit of the Spirit coming out in your behavior. It's about God who has said in Romans chapter 8 that you are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. So ladies, when you want to know if you are beautiful, go by God's standards rather than the world's. What's on the inside in your heart determines your beauty, not the external. That's why there are plenty of women who might be attractive on the outside, but they are by no means beautiful. So what is this gentle and quiet spirit that is imperishably beautiful and of great value to God? What is that? And how do you cultivate it? How do you get it? If something's of great value to God, if it's precious to God, we should take note, right? Right? Well, look again at verse 5 and 6. It says, For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do what is good, and you do not fear any intimidation. Now, we don't know exactly who these holy women of the past were, other than the one that is mentioned by name of Sarah. But all of these women focused on this inner beauty by, what does it say in verse 5? By putting their hope in God. That's the key. That's the key to this inner beauty. That's the key to this gentle and quiet spirit, even in the face of difficulty. And Peter says that Sarah displayed her submission to Abraham by calling him Lord. Well, if you study the Bible, that only happened one time in Scripture. It's very interesting. If You can turn to Genesis 18, verses 9 through 12, or it'll probably be on the screens for you. But Genesis 18, starting verse 9, it says, Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. They're in the tent, he said. And the Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So she laughed to herself, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I have delight? Now, what a strange statement for Peter to link back to. It's a passing statement of Sarah's unbelief in what God was telling them. But I think that's related to his point here. Even though Sarah's laughing and her kind of sarcastic comment to herself, even in that moment, her default is to show respect to her husband by using the culturally appropriate term for him at that time. So, wives, if you have this spirit of respecting your husband, and you do what is good, not fearing anything, not being intimidated by anything, then you prove that you are Sarah's children. You prove that you are her child. In other words, you prove that you have true faith in Christ. Now, a little background to the women that Peter is writing directly to that's very important. Many of these Christian women that Peter's writing to, many of them were being severely mistreated by their husbands. Physical abuse was very common at that time. You see, the culture said that women were inferior to men. The culture said that women were barely above the status of an animal. And so very often men treated the women that way. And Peter is telling them to cultivate this gentle, quiet spirit, even in the face of being mistreated. And he says, how do you do that? You do it through putting your hope in God. Because it's hope in God that leads you to being fearless, even when faced with intimidation, even when faced with difficult circumstances. This is how you have this quiet, gentle spirit. So hope in God produces a fearlessness. And that fearlessness produces a gentle, quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. It is precious to God. This gentle, quiet spirit is not just a personality trait. This doesn't mean that only women can please God, or the, the only women that can please God are the ones who are never aggressive in their speech. 
It doesn't mean that the women who please God are so gentle that they're a pushover, that they're a doormat. That's not what it means. What it means is that these women can be gentle and tranquil and full of peace even in the face of terrible circumstances because their hope is found in God. Not in circumstances, their hope is found in God. Not in their husband, their hope is found in God. Not in their children, their hope is found in God. So they don't have to fear anything or anyone because they fear God. They don't have to be intimidated by culture. They don't have to be intimidated by a terrible husband because their hope is in the Lord. It's this peaceful gentle, full of faith attitude that Peter is saying, that's what can impact an unbelieving husband. Now, just imagine this scenario. You have an unbelieving husband, and he tells his new convert wife, his wife is a new Christian, he tells her, no, you are to stop being a Christian, and I don't want to see you reading that Bible. Well, this This woman knows she can't do that. She can't recant her faith. She can't stop loving Jesus. Now that she knows what he's done for her, she can't stop. She can't renounce it. She can't stop reading the Bible. So she submits to her husband in all areas that she can, but she continues to study her Bible. She continues to worship the Lord. Imagine one day, that this unbelieving husband catches his believing wife reading her Bible even though he's told her not to. And imagine this man does what no man should ever do, but he bows up to his own wife in an attempt to intimidate her. But this wife has already decided that her hope is in the Lord. And she doesn't fear anyone but God. And because of her hope, because of her her faith, she is able to respond with a boldness and a fearlessness that shows itself, it manifests itself in a gentle and calm spirit as she explains to her irate husband that she loves him and she respects him, but her first and foremost allegiance is to God. That's the type of beauty that God says is precious in his sight. That's the type of beauty that God is looking for. That's the type of beauty that can eventually cause even an unbelieving husband to ask about his wife's incredible hope, like Peter talks about later in this chapter in verse 15. Verse 15. That's the type of beauty that God may be even more used to save him. So hope in God produces a fearlessness, and that fearlessness produces a gentle, quiet spirit, which is precious to God. Wives, if you want to impact your husbands for Christ, God says in 1 Peter 3, be submissive, be faithful, and be beautiful. And if you find yourself married to an unbeliever, or maybe tonight you find yourself married to a spouse, a husband who is not living for the Lord, boy, that can be tough. But remember the gospel. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Put your hope in him alone. And use these strategies to impact your husband for Christ. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Lord, many times your word tells us things that God is difficult for us. Lord, sometimes you tell us things that are outright impossible for us. And Lord, it is only through the power of the gospel, it is only through the Holy Spirit of God, your Holy Spirit living in us, Lord, it's only through us dying to ourselves and, Lord, you truly living in and through us, Lord, that we can do these difficult tasks. Lord, I don't know why you've led us to this passage on this night, but, God, I know that your word is supernatural. 
Lord, that you use it to accomplish your will and your purposes. And so, God, for the woman tonight, Lord, that needed this, Lord, for the man tonight that needed to hear this, even about women, Lord, would you give grace, Lord, to maybe a woman tonight who is married to an unbelieving husband. Lord, give her your grace, Lord, to be able to use these strategies to impact her husband. Lord, we pray for the salvation. We join that Christian wife in a prayer for the salvation of her husband. Lord, may there be many stories of Donnie Chalk. May there be many stories of Carolyn Chalk praying and being faithful to her husband for so many years. And Lord, then you getting all of the glory when that man comes to faith in Christ. Lord, make us more like Jesus, we pray. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.